it didn't come naturally to it at all. I found presenting really terrifying, really difficult. I think it's an awful idea. I just don't see a way in which it can benefit the sport. I can't wait for it. I hope that even though you're at home, you're still excited. This sport is being run without a strategy. And if you need that joke explaining, you're watching the wrong show. So Lydia, great to have you here in the Sydney Arms. It's a real pleasure to be interviewing you. The Thank roles you. are reversed for <laughs> once. Um, you're now known as broadcaster extraordinaire, I guess, but you've had so many roles within the industry. You've been a journalist, you do a lot of help behind the scenes that maybe people wouldn't know about. Just talk me through how your love of racing came about. My granddad was a punter, not a very good punter, quite a hopeless one actually, and I adored my granddad, so I used to spend all my time that I possibly could with him, and he used to go take me to the racing, take me to Wolverhampton races. Um, I used to um, have a, a bet with him at the weekend when he was watching the ITV7. He'd let me have five pences here and there um, to bet, and then it sort of grew from there really. Um, he, I used to, my parents, who were very strict, used to allow me to bunk off school on the Wednesday to go to the Cheltenham Festival when it was three days, so to go to um, Queen Mother Champion Chase Day, and I, used to, I did that from about the age of 12, I think, um, but I first started watching racing, um, my, the first race I remember, or the race that sparked my interest was the 1982 Grand National, because I had 10 pence win on Grittar, who won. Um, and it sort of sparked uh, an interest from that point onwards. And things got off to a positive start then. Yeah, those well, small I mean, I, think, I wonder. I mean, if you could sort of going back to people who get into racing, you know, how pivotal is that first bet winning? I don't know, uh, but yeah, certainly it definitely definitely didn't hinder it. And what were your first impressions as someone who didn't really come from a racing background then of the industry? Didn't at all come from a racing background in any way. Um, I don't know, what, what were my impressions of it? I don't know, I suppose I was so busy trying to swim that I didn't really have time to sort of think about what I thought of them. Um, I probably was too busy worrying about what they thought of me and whether um, I fitted in and whether I could do the job. Um, I thought it was... So when did that change happen from loving it and enjoying it to I want this to be my career? It kind of happened accidentally if I'm honest. I always used to idly say that I wanted to um, work for Channel 4 Racing um, but at the time I was uh, writing for the Sporting Life um, and doing all of that industry stuff um, and then there came an opportunity uh, where Chris Poole who um, people might remember is a very larger than life character he was the uh, race correspondent of the Evening Standard and he it, it, it was announced that he retired and I not expecting anything really wrote to the editor who was Max Hastings and asked whether I might be able to do something I just wanted to go and meet him to see if I could do something for the Evening Standard and um, I came away from that meeting with um, him having offered me a contract for six months to do two features a week on racing for the Evening Standard um, during that time the sports editors changed and the new sports editor called me in um, and I later discovered he was going to give me the sack because uh, he was wondering why I wasn't doing any news. At this point, I was writing news, but for the Racing Post and also doing the features for the Evening Standard. And I explained to him, well, I'd been told to do features, that that was my contract. I am actually doing um, news for the Racing Post. And so he then gave me a trial as um, racing correspondent because by that point, Chris Poole had left, had retired. Um, and then at the end of that three months, I got the job. So I was working there for as racing correspondent for more than five years. Um, and then the original At The Races um, started up and at that point it was going to be an, an all singing, all dancing channel and it was great at the start. You know, it was um, you know, a full day's broadcasting about horse racing and they wanted some new people to do TV. And at that point it was also becoming obvious that there were some uh, constraints and restraints to what you might be able to achieve as a print journalist. The internet was beginning to have an impact um, the amount of space that um, so was that there for have. a conscious decision on your yeah, part? Yeah, it was. Yeah, um, the space was getting smaller. The opportunities were getting smaller, and I just thought it was a sensible thing to do to sort of broaden my skill set, I suppose, and just have a go at um, presenting. By that point. I, I, the sort of things that I was saying, like I wanted to be on Channel 4 Racing, I wasn't sure whether I believed that anymore. That was just something that you said. I mean, it's a bit like when I was little, I used to say I wanted to be the first woman jockey to win the Grand National. I hardly rode a horse at that point, so it was just absurd. But I kind of knew it was a sort of challenging thing to say, and uh, particularly as a woman, and that it was 
uh, sort of expressing a sort of interest or a passion for the sport that I had that I didn't really know how my skill sets might sort of connect with it at the time so that was the best I had as again once I was initially going into the sport I thought that maybe it was Channel 4 Racing but I actually found out that I enjoyed writing a lot so um, I, I wasn't completely sure I was doing the right thing but I thought for broadening my skills it was probably a good idea at the time. And did it come naturally to you? No definitely not. Um, I found it terrifying, um, particularly the presenting part of it. Punditing, you know, being on the other end of the questions was a bit easier. I'm not, which is not to say that punditing is easy. I'm just Are you finding this easier than usual? Well, yeah, but, but enough. <laughs> in some ways, yes, and in some ways, really? no. Well, answering questions is... Is I mean because because the the framework is there for you, isn't it? You know, you you ask me the question and, and I answer it, but I try and you know potentially move it around to something I might want to talk about. It's a tussle, isn't it? Slightly sometimes, particularly if somebody is being used to interviewing. Rather and as than we mentioned beforehand, you're definitely going to be judging my style <laughs> throughout this. <laughs> definitely, I'm joking. <laughs> um, so. Um, uh, what were we talking about? So, so the coming naturally. Yeah, to no, it didn't. It didn't come naturally to at all. I found presenting really terrifying, really difficult. Uh, dealing but with people. But it never stopped you. Um, I did. I don't like not succeeding. <laughs> if I'm honest, um, so I tried a bit harder. Now we know that you're obviously uh, associated with racing TV and all the brilliant work you do there. Was there ever a decision to go terrestrial TV, more mainstream TV? How did that decision well, work? Well, I, I, there was a point where I, ha um, I had an offer from both Channel 4 Racing, who I was working for a little bit, very uh, small uh, amount of time, uh, and BBC Racing. And I ended up going and working for BBC Racing for three years. It wasn't something I enjoyed. Um, it just didn't really work out for me. It was probably a bit too soon for me, if I'm honest. I probably wasn't confident enough as a, as a broadcaster, confident or competent enough as a broadcaster at that time. And I found it uh, quite a, a cutthroat arena to be in. How so? Well, just because it, it is. I mean, in, in that environment, it is. I think, I think TV is generally, journalism can be, but um, journalism, I felt like I knew what I was doing. Whereas, as I said, at that point in my TV career, I didn't necessarily Do know what I was doing. you take it personally when you get setbacks? Is that difficult? Definitely, yeah, very, yeah. very much so. And, um, and also, I, you know, the, the BBC were increasingly dialing down its interest in horse racing, and I found that very difficult because um, I loved horse racing and wanted to be work, working in media to do with horse racing, not necessarily more widely, not that, that a wider option was open to me within, within the BBC. And also the way in which they wanted to present horse racing wasn't really what I wanted to do either. But it took me ages to work that out, um, that that wasn't for me, because obviously moving into terrestrial television is perceived as being what you aim for. That's meant to be synonymous with succeeding. Um, and that was the kind of mindset I was in at the time, I think. And uh, I had to take a step back and decide actually what I found to be rewarding in terms of what I did. And uh, that was uh, uh, quite a sort of steep learning curve. You and I have spoken before about some of the criticism that we've both got, whether you know that's to do with our gender or our position in the industry. How do you deal with the criticism that you get? And how has that changed over the years since you started in the industry? It was very, very difficult at first. Um, I felt that... Um, I wasn't very welcome in the early stages of my career. How? Um, did, how? How? Why did you feel like that? Because, uh, well, because people didn't want to talk to you. <laughs> if we're we're going to be completely honest. Um, I think people were slightly suspicious in some kind of way. I don't know. Um, I've tried to, to be fair in my work and and objective, but obviously sometimes objectivity is not perceived as necessarily as being fair to someone who's being subjective about a subject um, and I try to give people a right I, I would always be open to people to have a right of reply and um, seek it out if anything um, and how have I dealt with it um, it was difficult at first but I mean I just don't think I'd be doing the job properly otherwise I mean there, there wasn't really a choice so you either approach the job as a journalist and do what you think you should be doing you know bearing in mind you know this sounds very 
compass, I don't mean it to be, sort of mo- some, some, some sort of moral compass, there has to be, um, and some sort of um, reason why you're editorially pursuing this line. And I don't see the point of doing the job unless you're achieving that, unless you're doing that. It wouldn't, it, for me, that wouldn't be doing the job, so I may as well go and do something else. So to me, there wasn't particularly a choice in how I personally approach something like this. Um, so you very much detach you as a person from your job then? Try, I try to a little bit, yeah, I try to. I think, I think that helps. Um, and then as I, as I didn't go away, I suppose, <laughs> um, uh, and maybe um, people learned a little bit more about me, um, maybe uh, longevity has helped to some degree. Um, Do you think it should have been more welcoming to start with? I don't, I don't honestly know the answer to that question. Should it have been more welcoming? Some aspects, probably yes. Um, I think, I think more supportive is probably a better way of putting it. I think in some elements of journalism, from the journalistic side of things, I think there could have, and TV side of things, there definitely could have been more support, um, which there wasn't. Um, and then as I've got older and uh, been in the industry for longer. I suppose I hope that I'm doing the job well and that I continue to sort of check myself and make sure that that is the case. But obviously sometimes somebody will criticise you and they'll get you on a really bad day, or you know this, get you on a really bad day and it will really upset you. Um, and you know, something that you know, two days earlier would not at all, you just sort of w- wash off your back on another day might really get you down and that's just mm. humanity, isn't it? Five day festival? Oh God. (laughs) (laughs) Go on, what's your view on that? I think it's an awful idea. I just don't see a way in which it can benefit the sport. Um, Even if it's two further races, which I think we can all think that in the in the short term, having six races per day, you're shortchanging the customer who did have seven races per day and would be travelling to Cheltenham with all the expense that is involved in that and having less for their money. And I just don't think that can be tolerated. Um, so that's on the, in the scenario that there are two extra races. If we go to, as would be inevitable, I think, to a seven race a day model, you're then stretching the horse population, or certainly stretching the definition of what we all thought the Cheltenham Festival was beyond destruction, I think, because it's meant to be um, the clash of the very best. Increasingly, they have an opportunity to duck each other rather than to race against each other. And even at a handicap level, um, it was pitched at a certain level of, of handicap, and if you introduce Uh, other races they would necessarily be lesser races diluting races and you're just changing what the social what the Cheltenham festival means and if that is is and and we're already seeing a stretch on the horse population graded races grade two races in particular um, over the course of the season don't aren't competitiveness don't have big enough fields um, we don't have enough good uh, clashes day in day out And at the moment, we are stretching the horse population to a point where we are at active risk of turning off genuine fans of the sport. Um, Is it turning you off? Sometimes. I think it is, actually. Um, I know that's terrible, but, you know, sometimes you look at a race and there's four runners or there's five runners and you think, well, you know, and there's no pace. And, you know, you're just thinking, well, well, this isn't isn't very... I mean, I don't like... A race with odds on favourites, you know, it just it doesn't really. It's not an attractive me. puzzle to solve. No, it isn't. It isn't, and I think we are risking active disengagement of our fundamental fans, and I think that that is that is something that is not still now not being taken seriously enough. Probably primarily by race courses. I think I think many horsemen take that very seriously. Um, some less so, maybe. Um, but I don't think enough race courses take this seriously and I think it's a threat not just over jumps but also on the flat we've seen uh, um, sparse field sizes for class 2 handicaps um, we've seen group and listed races come under pressure um, and there is a, a feeling that British racing is kind of living a little bit too much on its reputation 
and not enough on what it is actively doing for fans of the sport and participants in the sport. Million dollar question, if Lydia Hislop was uh, in charge, what would change, what's the solution? Well, I mean, if, if there was an easy answer to that, you know, the people in charge of horse racing aren't stupid. Um, we would have found that answer already. I but think, do you think there's a, a way in which we should be going? I think, I think it does involve some um, consolidation of the pattern, um, jumps pattern and the flat pattern. It involves some reduction in the number of race fixtures. Um, and I do think that might involve some sort of short-term pain in terms of uh, levy income. But I think probably most bookmakers now agree with this. They wouldn't have been on this side of the argument about five years ago, but I think they are now, because I think they are concerned. They see a long-term trajectory about what it means for their profits and therefore for levy into horse racing, and that they think that some sort of strategic um, consolidation is necessary but the problem is there is no strategy I mean it's absurd but this sport is being run without a strategy and therefore any decision that is made along these lines will be done on a piecemeal basis will be done without any kind of long-term logic might not prove to be right um, but we d the problem is that the longer we keep waiting for somebody to agree what the way forward for British racing is, the, the steeper the dwindling gets. Are you worried? Yeah, actually I really am worried, yeah, I am. I'm worried about the future of British horse racing, yeah. What do you think it's going to look like in 10, 20 years down the line? Do you think it will exist? Yes, yeah I do. Um, I fear, I fear that in terms of flat racing, it will be a much less good product, that it will be um, less competitive, horses of a, a lesser level in the majority, in more of the majority than they are now, and obviously it's a pyramid, but you know, I mean that our, we will be denuded at the top of the horses that, that spark everybody's initial interest in horse racing. I mean, nobody got into horse racing via the nine o'clock Kempton, you can prove me wrong, but uh, nobody, nobody got into it via that. They got into it via the Grand National, the Derby, Royal Ascot. They got into it via some horse like that. I mean, maybe they got into it via um, a local horse that competed a lot locally at, at a certain level. That's perfectly possible, but you know, they didn't generally get into it from a class six handicap at Kempton. So we're getting into the heavy hitting subjects now. Let's talk about the uh, upcoming gambling review. Are you a big punter, first off? Um, I used to be um, for a while, uh, for about, about 12 years, 30 years, maybe it's a little bit more than that. Um, but since my mum died, don't know why, I just haven't. I mean, she died just before the pandemic began. Um, so obviously that was a natural hiatus anyway. And then I just haven't taken it back up since then to any serious degree. And I'm not saying I won't, but I haven't since. Why do you think that is? So I genuinely don't know. Um, it's a lot of work is one reason. You, you have to put a lot of work in. Um, maybe I've done more things journalistically and that's sort of filled the space. I kind of I don't really tend to have a plan in my in my career or my life and just sort of things happen and it's just happened and I've accepted it that way I'm not suggesting I won't go back to it I might I used to you know enjoy it but it is a lot of hard work yeah and just before we get on to the gambling commission again I'm interested you speak about your mum because it's clear that she had a big impact on you obviously um, and you spoke to racing welfare in a podcast they did about how her death impacted you. Um, just tell us a little bit about her and why you think that happened. <laughs> it took me by surprise to be perfectly honest. Um, I just, it, it, I just, uh, I found it was a, I had a lack of confidence afterwards. Um, that hasn't entirely dissipated yet. Um, she's just had a, a very large effect on me and uh, a larger effect, I mean it sounds stupid, a larger uh, effect than I was expecting her passing away um, and also the way in which it happened in that she had 
she fell ill, had an emergency operation, was getting better, and then suddenly died because she was about to come out of hospital into a, a, a flat that I'd found for her, and we were going to live together for a bit. So while I sort of eased her back into being her, um, and then that just sort of suddenly was whipped away very unexpectedly, um, or at least it was unexpected to me, um, and clearly unexpected to the hospital as well. Uh, so yeah, I, I, I suppose I'd probably, and then with the pandemic coming immediately after that, and it being such a weird year, I think really I might only be properly assimilating it now, but that's my guess, I don't really, I don't really know, I'm confused by it if I'm honest. What was your relationship like with her? <laughs> Volatile. She's very critical, uh, but very proud as well. Uh, she was uh, ambitious on my behalf, and then kind of critical when, <laughs> when, um, when I did something that she thought was a bit, you know, over the. Can top. you remember a specific instance? Oh, she always used to go. My my hair was an absolute obsession of hers. So, you know, I used to know that after I'd finished working at Racing TV, I would have a full, fully blown critique of what my hair looked like and what I was wearing. Um, mainly because you know she wasn't she wasn't massively into horse racing, so you know that was the thing she could critique, and she did. <laughs> How is that to sort of take? Because you seem like someone who you're very concerned about your performance and how you're performing your job. When it comes to how you look, is that something that bothers you? It was. I used to find it incredibly irritating. <laughs> <laughs> really, really, really irritating. But that was my. We were very, very close. But um, you know, she used to like pushing my buttons. Yeah. Let's get back to what we're initially talking about um, with the gambling review. Um, what do you think of that as a as a journalist? What sort of threat does that pose to the industry? A large one, but I think the industry, the way the industry has gone about it, hasn't really helped itself either. Um, I feel that it has aligned its arguments too closely with the with the bookmaking industry, um, and I think that the racing industry should have more responsibility to its customers. Um, so I feel that uh, too often um, race courses, but also horsemen sometimes link themselves up with um, a bookmaker, um, any new bookmaker who has cash and is prepared to sponsor. And I think it should be beholden on our sport to ask some basic questions of that bookmaker in terms of um, how they conduct themselves vis-a-vis -vis their, their customers how they deal with um, people who might be addicted, um, what their behaviour is in terms of people who are fans of the sport as well. And we get, sort of get into the area of, of restrictions. These days it tends not to be account closures, but it's as good as account closures. You know, you can have 18 pence each way when you wanted when you wanted 50 pounds each way or 20 pounds each way or whatever it might be um, and I think that the industry the horse racing industry should be seeking to link up with only responsible bookmakers who look after the the racing fan um, and I would be astonished if any of those questions are ever asked where do you think that's gonna lead us in the future then well, at the moment, I think the, what I fear is going to happen with the gambling review is that we're going to end up with a, a lot of restrictive measures that um, restrict people who may not have um, an addiction problem um, and that the measures won't be comprehensive enough, they won't be they won't see it from up here enough, it'll be too indi individualised when it comes to individual bookmakers rather than the whole of the industry and that therefore problem gamblers will still slip through the net but actually people who are, and I, I should actually retract that, I'm not, I don't like the phrase problem gamblers because it implies that it's the people themselves that, uh, that are only to blame whereas I don't believe that's the case, I believe that um, betting company uh, behaviour um, certain structures of the way in which they build their games, particularly their online casino games, all the casinos and the shops are designed to hook people, keep people playing, lack of time to reflect, 
uh, speed of replay, all of those things, I think they are, I mean, the social media companies develop it to keep people online. It's the same kind of, it's the same kind of technology and uh, but the betting industry has a responsibility towards people who might develop addictions in gambling in the same way that there is self-responsibility and just pushing it onto the individuals and calling them problem gamblers, I think is completely and utterly wrong and not looking at the right thing. Um, and I think what, I, what I'm concerned about is that we'll get to the other side of, of this review and not much will have actually changed in terms of um, the people. And peop you think it needs to? The peop yeah, the people who are, who are vulnerable, yeah, and, and behaviour, yeah, absolutely. I think some behaviours have improved, you know, the very fact that there is a review has prompted um, some behaviours on the gambling side of things, on the, on the betting company side of things to improve, but, you know, they have ended up, we might end, end be tending towards a more intrusive um, way of looking into people's gambling. It won't be proportionate, I suppose, is what I'm saying. That that there'll be there'll be people who need help who aren't helped, and people who don't need help who are inconvenienced, bothered, and might be turned off from gambling, and that could impact on um, racing. I mean, you know. Gambling is a betting companies and the levy is about people losing money gambling, and that's just a fact. Um, and so, you, it's just got to be within a, a, a self a, a, a controlled area. I mean, you've got to be able to lose what you can afford and enjoy doing so. Um, that it's that you're getting something out of it other than necessarily a profit, which many people do very very safely. If the levels of hurdles that they have to jump in order to be able to do that are disproportionate, then they're not going to do that. And that is going to harm horse racing. From speaking to you, I get the impression that in some ways you think the industry is sleepwalking into several problems. I think so, yeah. I think they are. I think they are, because they're too busy just bickering amongst themselves. But it's always been like this. But the, I suppose I don't think the threats have been so great. They've just got bigger and bigger and bigger around them. and. Uh, the squabbling has just continued because everybody's intent on their own personal subjective business plan which often cuts across what might be best for the greater good of the sport I think. A lot of this um, sort of discussion I think has been around racing's problems what are you excited for what are you looking forward to at the moment? Well we just had a fantastic 2000 guineas I can't remember being so excited about a 2000 guineas for years i really was i felt like every horse that should be there was there they'd brought together all the different strands of juvenile form and after this guineas we're probably going to go in lots of different directions some of them will continue miling some of them go back sprinting some of them go to middle distances but with quite a realistic proposition of being quite significant horses at this stage I feel that that was a very strong deep guineas so I'm quite excited to see what all of the horses will do out of that the 1000 guineas I mean it was a great result um, I really enjoyed Caché winning it was great for George Bowie um, such a career on, on fast forward great for James Doyle to get that very emotional double you know waiting all this time to get an English classic and then you know, getting to interview weekend. him that was that was that was really great. I mean, there's I mean, you said earlier, wh where do I find interviewing difficult? That wasn't difficult because um, James was being incredibly honest. He was there in the interview, being honest, asking questions and offering what he really felt. So those are really great interviews to do because the person is giving you so much. They're being so generous with with how they feel and what they're thinking that you know, you'd, you'd be very bad indeed if that wasn't a good interview. Is that what you feel you get the most reward out of doing those sorts of interviews? I do, I, yeah, I do, I do enjoy those interviews. I do, whenever there's a proper connection, um, and it's, I don't just mean with me, I mean via me to the audience, I feel that that's doing the job properly, definitely. Um, but also, I mean, I, I do get job satisfaction from challenging and asking difficult questions that's because I, I feel all of that is my job it's you know it's good news and it's challenging and you know and exploring bad news you know but the whole of that is my job and I, sh you know, I should be able to do all of it really and I, I enjoy when any element of that I think is good is well done and that the audience reader listener will feel um, informed entertained, mm. educated even sometimes. Final question, how have I done? <laughs> <laughs> I 
Very well. I mean, you've made me feel nicely uncomfortable, so I think that's, that suggests that you've been oh, no. probing enough. No, I just suggest you've been probing enough. I've had to think about answers to the questions. I, ho I hope I feel, you feel like I've engaged with you properly. Yes, absolutely. I feel like I could do more and more digging, but we'd probably be here until about midnight. So, uh, <laughs> it's, get, it is getting, it's literally getting dark. <laughs> so, I think that'll do us today. Thank you so much, Lydia. Thank you very much.